Welcome everyone to another wonderful talk series. I'm James, one of the Everything ALS Fellows. Uh, we've got a very exciting night tonight and we're gonna start, I'm gonna give it back to Mira to talk a little bit more about our speech study and our new Radcliffe study as well. Great, but I made James promise that he would share his screen. And I'm gonna do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we'll get this in presentation mode. So our speech study um, is with modality. Like I said, it's, it's 15 minutes. We can go to the next slide. Um, 15 minutes, uh, once a month, it's IRB approved. We're trying to increase the demographics of people within our study, uh, mostly persons living with ALS, mostly looking for, um, any, any patients. Uh, I'm so sorry, pals. Um, okay. Next slide. And we can go through this later. Keep going. Perfect. So I really wanted to talk to you really briefly about the Radcliffe study. And this is the, the big study coming on um, right now. It's, it's IRB approved. It's a multidisciplinary study where we focus on um, your walking analysis, your gait analysis, and your breathing function. So let's move to the next slide. So I'll give you a quick overview of the speech study. So, or I'm so sorry, the Radcliffe study. Lots of studies in my head. Um, we're going to start with a breathing exercise, and I should have grabbed my um, props for you, but um, you'll start doing breathing tests, um, and everything will be done at your home. So we will send you um, a package of materials. Um, so you'll do a breathing test, then you'll do a, a small portion of a, a speech battery, and then you would do some walking exercises. Um, and then we would do another short speech function and then another breathing test. Go ahead. Um, if you are interested in the study, we are actually um, doing the study, looking at a few different things to hopefully develop some more digital biomarkers. And with that being said, we are looking for um, persons diagnosed with ALS in their early stages, or even people who are in their probable diagnosis, or if you're a slow progressor, because we do have some of the walking exercises and we want to make sure that everyone is safe while doing this. So um, this is our Everything ALS website. Um, if you just go to the tab, it's www.everythingals.org. You hit the research button and then you hit the ALS Radcliffe study or speech study, whichever one you're interested in. Next. And then from here, you can hold on one second. You can either click the speech study or the Radcliffe study and you can click for more information. Go ahead. Next slide. Perfect. And so this is the particular Radcliffe page. So um, we tell you a little bit more about the study, certain requirements we might have within the study and the purpose of it, the procedures, and fill out this form if you're interested. It just has some basic information, um, your first name, last name, what you're interested in, your shoe size, because we'll need it if you do qualify for the study and we need to ship a mailing package out. The benefit of the study is that you will get all of that data right back to you in our Everything ALS app. And that is especially wonderful because sometimes our neurologists are busy and they can't see you. And, you know, you can bring this information. Hey, look, look at my breathing test. Hey, look, look at my um walking test look at my speech and um it's it's really a cool study and and we'd really love to get you on board so if you don't mind take a look at everything ALS email me email rad study email anyone you'd like we we're interested in having you or talking a little bit more about this study um so it'll be nine to 12 months and all of this information will be online so you can keep skipping through and the the biggest criteria for this study is that um, 18 to 80 years old, um, we we need you to be able to independently ambulate walk without any gate assist assistive devices. So that means um, if we we want you to be able to walk without um, a rollator, without a wheelchair. Um, 
we do need to have a, a pretty good breathing function. But this is something that we can all talk about. If you want to fill in the interest page, then I'll take a look at everything you've said. And then we can either email or talk on the phone or have a Zoom call. And I'm, I'm really excited to meet all of you. Um, we can go on to the next page. And you can continue. Are there any questions out there? I've been ignoring the chat. I think everyone is getting their questions answered. And Indu, thank you for the web page support. Um, this study is for individuals living with ALS. And, and unfortunately, um, it, the IRB is only approved for people living within the Americas, America. <laughs> USA. <laughs> Sorry, I tried to be funny with that and just didn't work out. Um, the sample size, we are aiming for about 100 people in our study. We already have several, and so we're really excited for the data that's coming in. All right. Um, thank you all so much for your time and attention. Um, and we are just launching this study, so we already have six people within it. However, we will continue to grow. And I have a, a an interest page that I need to get through to make sure, um, you know, that people fit all of the criteria. So um, this will be great. Okay. And what I'll do now is I'm going to throw it back to James to introduce Terry. If you have any lingering questions, thoughts, concerns, please type it in the chat. Um, I'm going to be here and we look forward to hearing from Terry. <laughs> I'm your biggest cheerleader over here. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Lyle might be your biggest cheerleader. I know we'll, we'll I saw Lyle here. Yeah. Thank you. What? What? Well, Go ahead. I say either way, we're excited. And I, I know uh, Dr. Hyman Patterson is, is no stranger to our talk series as she's been a guest before. Uh, for those of you who may have not had the privilege to see our previous meetings there, I'm going to read a little bit of a biography so you can get a little bit of background information. Uh, Dr. Hyman Patterson is the director of the Center for Neurodegenerative Disorders and a professor in the Department of Neurology at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. She directs the MD ALS Center of Hope, including the clinical and laboratory research programs. She has received more than a dozen grants to do both basic and clinical research in ALS along with other neuromuscular diseases. Dr. Hyman Patterson is also committed to optimizing clinical care at the MDA ALS Center through the multidisciplinary approach to care along with clinical research directed at extending survival and improving the quality of life. She has also initiated a program to develop the BCI, which stands for Brain Computer Interface, for home-based use by people living with ALS in order to allow increased independence. Finally, she is funded to examine ways to reduce caregiver burden in families where the person living with ALS has cognitive involvement. She serves as a co-chairman of the executive committee of the Northeast ALS Consort, uh, consortium. There's always a word I butcher on these biographies, and that's that one. And is a member of the ALS RG, an international study group. Dr. Hyman Patterson has published over 90 papers, abstracts, and chapters on ALS and related motor neuron diseases, along with more than 60 more on other areas of muscle and nerve disease. Without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Hyman Patterson. Thank you. Uh, that was far more than needed. The, earned, well earned. <laughs> <laughs> the, my basic uh, thing is I want to make a difference to people living with ALS. That's all that matters, right? Uh, so I think I shared my screen. Uh, am I? Did I share my screen properly? And Perfect. Okay. So today, um, I want to talk about something that's really near and dear to my heart and, and that um, I've really been committed to, to pushing forward, uh, limping along a little bit because I work a lot with students, but, but I know that, that we can do it. And that, that's leveraging technology for independence. And um, as I start, of course, I, I realize I usually leave this out, but uh, I always forget to put in my conflicts because I don't think of them as conflicts since they don't influence me, but, but this can show you my clinical trial funding, the advisory boards, all, all that 
stuff and some of the educational programs that that I've participated in. So, uh, so I'm open about that. Um, but you know, as Steve Gleason has said, until there's a cure, technology will be the cure. And when a patient is diagnosed with ALS, they're expected to fade away and die, but this is not okay. The average life expectancy, which I know everybody on this uh, Zoom knows, is two to five years after diagnosis. And along with thousands of others, I'm determined not to fade away quietly. By communicating with other patients, it became clear to me that with a sense of purpose, the right support and the right technology, it is possible to live a meaningful life uh, despite ALS. And uh, you know, that should be an inspiration to all of us. And it's so true. And one of the challenges for ALS or for technology with ALS is ALS is an ever changing landscape. And we all know that too well. And so this shows uh, somebody I, I cared for um, and over the course of one year, he went from going out and walking around and doing everything to being chair bound on event. And that changing landscape means whatever technology we use needs to be able to change and adapt. And, and that's always been a, a challenge. And what are the most important things when it comes to, uh, you know, we talk about assistive technology. I'm gonna focus on brain computer interfaces today, but assistive technology is really anything that assists, any technology that assists somebody to be more independent, basically. And when we survey PALS, the things that are most important to them really are activities of daily living, communication, and mobility. And, and part of all of that, or part of independence also, I think, includes environmental control. In other words, being able to do things for yourself and not call a caregiver, which is turn on a TV, turn on a light, you know, call for someone. Um, but the real key is in enabling independence. And so, you know, we, uh, everybody knows about mobility devices, canes, crutches, ambulatory uh, aids, seated wheeled mobility from manual uh, chairs to, to power wheelchairs, um, transfer devices, Hoyer lifts, you know, communication, we've got smartphones, we've got tablets, we've got computers and their accessibility that's built right in that I, I think that, you know, most, most people uh, know about. Uh, and then we have our uh, eye gaze systems, our mytobies and augmentative communication devices, um, you know, and, and we even have ways to access if we can't use our hands, we've got the mouse, we've got the head mouse, we've got eye gaze. Um, all that's that's uh, great, and then as I mentioned, you you have computer access that's built into the operating system. It's virtual keyboards, virtual mouse, voice activation if you're still able to talk. But what comes next as as ALS progresses, right? And and uh, honestly, one of the things that that drives me to this is I hated seeing pe people make the decision that they'd rather not live than live with ALS because they were locked in. And, and how, do, how do we unlock someone as, as the disease progresses? Well, the answer is brain computer interfaces. And um, this is just sort of a pictorial and we're gonna talk a little bit more about what a brain computer interface is. And this is, where users' choices are made using their brain waves uh, instead of the usual activity, talking, moving my arm. The, the, the signals are usually acquired through electrodes. And we'll talk about the different types of sensors or electrodes that you can have. They're processed, the signal is acquired and processed and features are extracted that that will say, this is what the intent was. I wanted to make this choice. I wanted to, to turn a light on. I wanted to uh, move my wheelchair. It, it translates, I wanted to select a letter on a letter board. It makes a choice and it sends that choice 
back to the device so that it can implement whatever the command was. And you know, this takes less movement to, for instance, to use a spelling board to communicate. You know, there's less movement movement needed than for eye tracking or switches, and obviously could add to the independence of of someone. Uh, and so, what are the components of this brain computer interface? Well, you know, in addition to the signal that that you're going to look at, that that might be a letter board or uh, whatever a set of icons, uh, we use a potential called the P300, which is what we call an event uh, related potential. So that when I see something I want to attend to, I want to choose, it sets up this P300 potential in my brain. And it's called the P300 because it occurs 300 milliseconds after the target that I was looking at. So, you know, I, I see a target, it sets up a potential in my brain somewhere, uh, and that potential can be recorded. And the first part is how do you sense it? And that's called the neural sensor. And the goal is to extract those signals and get the algorithm going to trans extract the proper features and translate it into what your intent was. And so, you know, you want to know what signal to record. And some of the challenges are where that sensor is. And sensors can be in the brain itself. It can be uh, on the surface of the brain or superficial. And we'll show you some examples of those. And that signal then gets translated into an action. It might be, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but it might be choosing an icon from a series to for an action like turn on a light um, turn on music it might be turn on the tv we're even uh it can even be used for uh movement of uh, you know a device an arm or a, you know a, or or a wheelchair and we're actually working on that as well and uh and it's been typically used for spelling right now for most of, most of the uh, trials in, in terms of getting it to, to work, but certainly it can be used to drive any assistive technology. And so what are the different sensors? These are the things that are gonna pick up the brain activity. And um, as I said, you can have them sitting in the brain on top of the brain. And one of the most unique sensors I think is the one that is threaded up into the sinuses, the veins of the brain. Um, and I'll show you a picture of that. And then uh, it can be superficial. And that's what we use, uh, which is a superficial EEG. It, it's a little bit uh, muddier. It's a little more difficult to extract the potentials, but it also doesn't involve surgery or invasive procedures. And we now can use uh, dry electrode caps and, and, and it's uh, much easier to put on, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So you can have these subdural electrodes, uh, but this is, that means it goes, uh, you know, under the dura of the, of the brain. And that means cutting a hole in the skull to get there. So you have a craniotomy. It can take a couple of procedures. Um, it uses generally uh, 16 channels. That means there'll be 16 electrodes in an array you know, uh, in, a, in a grouping. Uh, but uh, using this, uh, people were able to get a BCI that could identify a character every 52 seconds. In other words, uh, every 52 seconds, you could choose a letter that went up on a board. And uh, they sh the investigators have shown that it can be used in the home. The thing I think is really neat is uh, this electrode array that it's like a stent. People have heard of stent. You put a stent in the heart to open up an artery. Uh, you can put a stent in the veins of the brain. Uh, up here, you can see that sagittal sinus. That's one of the draining veins, a big one in, in the brain. And you can thread this, this stent up, which has the electrodes into that area. And that really gets it pretty close to the brain, not in the brain, but pretty close so that the detection is, is a little bit uh, better. And you can, you can see here uh, where the ruler is in the lower left, how 
actually small this thing is that's millimeters so uh pre i think that's pretty neat and, and in theory uh that could be inserted and left with a something to detect um the problem is now the detection system uh whoops the the detection system uh is really hooked in uh you you have something hanging out here and that's where your detection system is uh so you it's still a little bit uh, invasive. Um, and then we have the, you know, what everybody knows about the, the brain gate, which is really, uh, you can see it's, it's a major surgical procedure and it's in the brain. It's implantable. It probably gives the best um, signal strength, obviously, because it's right there. No, no interfering skull, no skin, no hair is right in the brain, but it, it does mean wearing these things and having brain surgery. Um, but but you could liter literally, it uses motor imagery and, and it's even been able to, to be used to, to write with. I mean, that's an alphabet that somebody wrote using brain, using their brain and motor imagery. So, you know, that this is really exciting, but it's sort of not ready for prime time yet. And it's gonna involve being able to, to accommodate surgery and, and having these electrodes in your brain. So we got interested in non-invasive brain computer interfaces and using this, the P300 that I, I mentioned before, this, this potential that when, uh, in this case, when you see a letter light up, uh, suppose I want that letter B, Every time that I just stare at the letter and every time it lights up, I attend to it. And that sets up this potential in my brain 300 milliseconds later that this EEG cap can decode. Um, and, you know, it, it is feasible at home. Uh, and certainly you can use it not only for spelling, but for other things. And I'm just going to show you, uh, hopefully this runs, but I'm going to show you uh, the time it's going to take for one letter to be chosen. And you'll see all the letters light up. This is called the checkerboard pattern. Uh, and you'll see that the, the letters will line up in, in rows and columns. And there we go. So, and then a letter popped up here. He was actually spelling his son's name. And uh, you saw how long it took. And I want you to pay attention. This, is, this was a standard research system. And so, uh, you know, you have actually two computers. You have one computer that's projecting uh, the letters on, on the screen, another, another computer that's attached to this it, this was actually when we were uh, using 32 electrodes and each of those electrodes had to have gel placed. It took about 45 minutes to put the electrode cap on. Um, and you can see it's being used, uh, somebody's on a ventilator, so it could be used uh, with a ventilator running. But this whole system uh, took about 45 minutes to an hour to set up and calibrate. You can see it's complex. I wouldn't expect a caregiver necessarily to be able to deal with this, especially if they weren't, you know, technologically uh, trained. And the cost of a system like this would be somewhere in the area of twenty-five thousand dollars. We began our studies using this, and and one question that that I had was, you know, okay, this. Will this continue to work over time? Is there, is there any effect on disease, of disease progression on the efficiency or on what goes on when we use uh, brain computer interface over, over time? And, and we looked at 19 folks um, and the average time from diagnosis was uh, 23.2 uh, months. Uh, it varied, uh, uh, you know, from, uh, whoops, let's go back. Uh, it, it, it varied as, as you can uh, see from 
uh, you know, uh, something like about 12 uh, to 36 months. And we looked at the ALS FRS score and that varied from nine to 44. So, you know, the every I don't have to tell you the meaning of the ALS FRS score, I don't think, but just in case, you know, the lower the number, the more functionally impacted someone is. And when we uh, used the standard research BCI 2000 software with a 16 channel wet electrode uh, amplifier, using that checkerboard pattern I, I showed you, asking people to spell five words uh, and, uh, you know, 25 letters over uh, the trial. Um, the accuracy ranged anywhere from 32 to 100 percent, but actually 11 or 12 folks were well over 70 percent. The accuracy was look, we looked at, you know, how it correlated with the age, the time since diagnosis and the rating score. And the only significant correlation was as somebody got more functionally impacted, the performance uh, dropped. Uh, in terms of their accuracy, how well they could spell those words. So why was that? Well, you know, it could be just the disease progression, the effects on the brain, but it's also more fatiguing. And, you know, to, to somebody who's weaker and further progressed, there'll be more weakness. And, and so uh, the sessions may be longer, require a lot of attention, that increased fatigue, uh, has been shown to reduce the amplitude of the P300. The amplitude is what the amplitude of the potential that's detected. And if that drops, it's harder to detect. So, so you know, the fatigue that comes with being further progressed may have impacted the ability to detect. And the reclining position and, and uh, may increase the fatigue and strain also. So, you know, we were like, okay, what what can we do about this? How can we design and develop a brain computer interface that is portable, practical, and low cost? You know, I told you the, these systems are going to cost twenty, thirty thousand um, dollars. But how can we do something that's low cost, practical, portable, and usable, user friendly, using things that are available off the shelf that we can put together with the right programming. And so that started our sort of journey that, that we're on and we're still on that journey, but we're moving forward and I'm gonna show you uh, some things now. So uh, we decided, okay, what's some of the new technology? And the first thing we uh, wanted to do was uh, to try augmented reality glasses. The thought was rather than somebody having to look at a computer screen, perhaps we could have the screen right in front of their eyes. So no matter what position they were in, there it was. And here you can see what the glasses would look like. And this is actually the, our targets projected on the glasses. Um, you can see this. And so the one way to simplify the system was to have the screen right in front of someone use uh, the technology. And then we wanted to decrease all that complexity to computers, all those wires, um, you know, the, the whole footprint of this system. And so, uh, you know, the traditional BCI, we had these 16 channel wet electrodes. Well, we went to look for something that was simpler and found an, uh, an available a device, the unicorn cap that was eight channels. It could be used dry. That means I didn't have to, I didn't have to put gel on every electrode. It can use Bluetooth rather than be connected with wires. For our display, rather than using a computer and a fixed LCD monitor, well, I mentioned we, we wanted to start with the AR headset and we're gonna talk about where we're going next. But, and for processing, you know, you can, the, it's those laptops were being used. Well, we have been working on using uh, a Raspberry Pi, which is a very compact uh, uh, computing computer, and also 
Uh, there's some other computer boards that also can be used like the LADA. Uh, and, and we're finding out that we, meet, we may need to, to use different ones depending on what uh, our display is, which are our headset, because to drive the headset, uh, sometimes you need different power and you need to use different uh, languages. And then uh, the uh, interface we wanted, rather than uh, spelling out words and sentences, we wanted to, to integrate this with a Google Home Assistant or, or an Alexa or any Home Assistant. And that's those, those icons. And so here you go. We, we started with our unicorn headset, which is off the shelf. Uh, it's an eight channel dry electrode, which means we don't have to put gel all over. It just slips right on. And um, we, this, by the way, costs about $900. The AR headset, which you can get various, you know, this one happens to be Dream World. It's about 1200 but I'll show you some solutions that are far cheaper. So we're still well under 5,000. This uh, shows you what the interface uh, looks like on the AR glasses, uh, a laptop or a desktop PC can be Bluetooth to the unicorn and, and uh, also to the AR headset or hooked in to project. You project the targets on this headset, the brain detects it, and then it has to go back to be decoded through the, through the same uh, computer to minimize the number of computers. And so we've been working on doing this. And in fact, uh, we uh, have started home testing it, beta testing it and, and taking it into the home. And I show this only to show you that they, we had, we've tested it on a variety in le of levels of uh, disease. And here you can see someone who was using our system actually with a, a ventilator uh, and someone who's uh, less uh, progressed uh, and, and so, uh, and, and it is in their homes. And this shows you the array of equipment that we, we use the different um, Alexa, Google Home, different home assistant devices. This is the light that we have hooked up to show success. Um, a TV screen can be turned on and off. Um, and this is the ladder board, which is one of the uh, smaller computer boards that we're able to use and as our uh, output and input. Uh, so. Uh, it's working. And I'm just going to show you uh, an example of uh, one of our folks uh, using this. And uh, if you listen carefully, I hope the sound is up. Turn your sound up. You'll hear at the very end the voice command for the uh, Alexa, or we are using Google Home in this case, the Google Home to, to turn on a, a light. And then if you look here, you'll see the light go on. And so you see the flashing signals. And he's attending to the one he wants and, to, and it, it'll select it. Turn on desk light. And so, uh, you know, that uh, shows you that certainly it's usable. We're working on efficiency. And not surprisingly, uh, when we, we did uh, the accuracy when we were in the house was upwards of 75%. Um, there was no relationship of accuracy between the ALS FRSR uh, and, and accuracy. And some of that may be attention and, and so forth. But what was shown that was that 
the we did two scores. One was uh, task load, and one was usability. And so one really was a measure of fatigue, and one was, did you would you use this? Uh, did you find this useful? And the only correlation we found was the relationship that the lower the ALS FRSR score was, the higher the usability score was. So that that the more impacted someone is, the more they find this usable, and I, I suspect the more they want to focus on being able to to use it because it could be a value for their independence. So, um, but you know we. There are some challenges. The AR headset was large, it's clunky. It's a little bit more costly. Um, the system that you're looking at probably is under 5,000, but uh, it's still costly. And, and there were some, some problems with the headset. It's designed for gaming, right? Like everything else. And so it required more powerful graphics and more advanced computing. And some of the interface, we had some juggling around and it, it would bugger up. So. We've been moving around and looking at different solutions. And so we came up with yet another solution, which was, you know, still our single board uh, computer, the Raspberry Pi or equivalent, our unicorn headset. And we're actually 3D printing what uh, glasses and putting LC an LCD screen. You can buy this LCD screen for 10 bucks, by the way. But you know, we, we use a better one that's more like 50. And we're now designing glasses that are a little bit bigger and almost like a visor uh, that will go on. They'll be lightweight and they won't be as bulky on the, on the back end. Uh, and uh, this shows you the, the system again. Here's some of the components, the power supply, Raspberry Pi. This, by the way, is probably uh, about $2,000. Um, and this shows you uh, one of the prototypes that we've been working and, and we got about 81% accuracy with this. There's the headset, the LCD screen, which, you know, obviously you can pretty up and, and in case we're just trying to get it to work. And there's your Raspberry Pi and the battery pack for the Raspberry Pi. And while not elegant, not the icons, uh, the choices are here that you can pick from. And there, this time you pick phone call. And here you can see, this is what the EEG cap is recording and what we're, the signal that we're acquiring and processing to make a choice. It just shows you uh, some of that. And then here's, uh, he selected TV on in, in this case. So, uh, you know, we're, we're very hopeful that we can really fine tune this, really get it working in a way that, that will be useful. And we're looking to do plug and play so that you can tell us what you want and how we can make it useful for, for you. You know, I want to be able to do X. Um, and we're longer battery life, how we can turn it on and off independently, uh, whether we can drive a power wheelchair. Um, we're uh, working to design uh, 3D printed glasses that'll, that'll uh, encase the LCD screen and different LCD uh, screens. And then we're going to be also looking uh, at ways to detect fatigue and seeing how we can reduce it. And we're gonna be using uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is optical in imaging. And this is really neat because uh, basically you see that this headset, it just goes around the front of the head and there's a light source and a light, and these are light detectors. So you beam the light, it goes uh, uh, superficially into the brain, and then you record what reflects back. And what it can look at is hemoglobin and whether it's oxygenated or deoxygenated. So if you subtract those, you get the oxygen uptake. How much oxygen is someone using, which is a measure of brain metabolism. So, you know, this is a way to measure the hemodynamic changes of blood oxygenation during tasks. Uh, and so it can be used to track fatigue with BCI use. 
And, and so we're going to be combining it. And that way we can tweak the system and, and learn what's going to make it more or less fatiguing to the user. Um, we've actually begun to look at FNIR uh, with cognitive tasks. So, so this shows you our electrode array. The red is, you know, this lays on the brain. And, and so this is uh, sort of, uh, this is the very prefrontal cortex. And this is uh, sort of just behind uh, the frontal cortex on either side, the left and the right. Um, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And so the red is on the left and the yellow is on the right. And this shows you the oxygen use uh, when you give uh, the PVT as a cognitive load test. So we're giving, we give this test and then we look at the oxygen use by, by the uh, person doing it. And you can see that for people with ALS already, uh, there is more uh, an increase in, in the amount of oxygen for each task. And uh, it was not necessarily uh, in this study correlated with uh, disease burden or you know, ALS-FRSR score, but we tended to use people who were really early in, in the disease for this. But, but it just shows you how it can be used and that there are differences uh, for folks uh, with, with ALS in terms of the the amount of metabolism for a task. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to do is make something low cost uh, and functional uh, that uh, can be used in the home environment and simplify it to, to help with social interactions and restore autonomy. And, you know, the, the P300s, uh, they'll be able to be used for all kinds of things. They can be used for communication, browsing the internet, moving a robot, driving a wheelchair. And I mean, I think we all agree that while uh, waiting for cures and the drugs that stop disease progression, assistive technology can be our path to independence. And uh, in my mind, although it's in the wrong place, the sky is the limit. And um, I thank you for uh, your time and listening to, to something I'm so passionate about. Well, thank you. I mean, that's, I think, absolutely incredible that we're on the cusp of something even remotely possible like this. Um, we've had a lot of questions during the presentation, so myself and Bella, a student ambassador, are going to ask them, and I'm going to kick it off with our first question of how complex can BCI get? Does it have the potential to interface with a something like a robotic walker or robotic arm so people living with ALS can be even more independent and mobile? It absolutely can, can uh, operate with a robotic arm. Um, and and actually the, the senior students in, who are working in our lab, um, I collaborate with uh, Dr. Hassana Yaz uh, for all of this. He's a biomedical engineering professor at Drexel, where I was before I went to Temple. And we got to, well, we got close. I was on his committee, his thesis committee, where he designed EFNIR. And, um, you know, uh, we've been working together over the years to, to do this. Um, one of the senior student projects from the Drexel students this year is going to be to drive uh, a robot and, and um, you know, a drone. So, yeah, I mean, it's all possible. Incredible. In fact, the students are trying to ask pals, we can use everybody's help. We want to know what you would like to do if we could drive a drone. What would you want that drone to do? Because I was, I told the students they had to figure that out too. <laughs> <laughs> Bella, you want to take the next question? Hi, yes. Um, so my next question is, do people with living, living with ALS tend to undergo electrode implantation at the same time as the feeding tube placement or track placement to decrease effects of anesthesia and reduce the number of surgeries needed? Oh, no, um, at this point, those are not like the brain gate is not something that you can just get. It's really research. That's the other point is that 
all of these fancy systems are still in the research stage. And that's what I mean by pragmatic. I want to get it in. The, we've got the technology now. I want to see it developed and in homes now. I want to see people using it now and using and being able to use off the shelf inexpensive systems, not spend their life savings on a system. But no, people, you know, that, that would be nice if, if they were available and you could just say, oh, I think I'll get my brain gate today, but you can't do that yet. Well, that plays perfectly into the next question, which is always our popular one of, as of it stands right now, does insurance cover this procedure? Okay, well, that's a good question because I've been thinking about that a lot. The way you would do things is if it has a speller, that's a communication device. And so that's smart. So you no matter whether you want it or not, you're getting a speller with these systems once we get them. You know, my my goal is, is to really be able to put these systems together in, in a in a way that you know people can ask for them and we can get them to them uh, at, at as low a cost as possible. The big cost is going to be the programming. And also when I get these systems and I'm able to give them to folks, we need people who are gonna troubleshoot. I mean, when you have, I know you're gonna have trouble with the system, right? That, you know, I, I can see, you know, uh, it's not like, everybody's uh, technologically savvy for these things. And so it's, it's going to, so, so we need to have a, somebody on the other extension saying, okay, what's your problem, you know, and be able to troubleshoot, which also means building into the system, something that we can remotely look at what's going on. So, but yes, put a speller in there and it's a communication device. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is, who doesn't qualify for BCI? Well, okay, so if you had a BCI system, everyone would qualify. And it's not like a clinical trial where, you know, um, where we, we would only give it to certain people or anything. In fact, we need to look at it over a spectrum. What, but what you'll find is it's sort of like, okay, everybody, let's be real. I know my the folks I care for, they have eye gaze systems. We get them the eye gaze as soon as we can and they get the AAC devices. When do they use it? I can't even get them to practice it until they literally can't talk and can't write. So, uh, you know, so I suspect that the people who are really gonna be able to focus and attend to the details of, of practicing and learning how to use these will be people who need them and are at that stage. It's, it's too bad because like all of these things, just like eye gaze, right? When you, when uh, folks who have the eye gaze, you know that it took you time to get used to it, to learn how to use it. These systems are not gonna be any easier. In fact, you know, you really have to, when you, when you use them, you really have to attend to detail. You can't be, you know, hey, you know, listening to what's going on in the kitchen while you're trying to use your BCI, you've got to really focus on that screen because the, the brain potentials have to be of high enough amplitude to be detected, which means you're focused. Well, that makes a lot of theoretical sense. <laughs> um, for the individuals who have, who have undergone the BCI procedure, what was the recovery process like? Well, okay. Well, with my system, there's no recovery needed, <laughs> uh, except for washing your hair if you had the gel electrodes. They're, they're pretty messy. Um, I'm not sure um, about brain gate and, and what that was like. I would imagine with a burr hole, you know, you, you're pretty good the next day, but, but you're living with that in, in your brain. It's an increased, I mean, and, and if, if you knew that you could, oh, well, I mean, if it's more, if it's more rapid, let's face it, if it's more capable, more rapid and cost-effective, in terms of not breaking the bank. Maybe, maybe down the pike, when the research is done and it's really mobilized to general use, people would choose the brain gate over, over the system I'm working with. But right now the brain gate isn't available and these systems could be put together. And, gotcha. and, and, with, and, and with work, they could be made to be more and more efficient and, and, and better.
So another question was um, if BCI patients need to be monitored like pacemaker patients do? No. Uh, so the BCI is, you know, you take it on and off. It's just your, your brainwave. That, that's why I like that dry electrode cap. You put it on like you put a hat on, set it up. That's two minutes. Any caregiver will be able to do that. Um, and, you know, you take it off when you're done. Um, some people might choose to have it on all the time. And what we're trying to do is work out how do I turn my BC on myself without even calling my caregiver. I wear the cap, maybe, you know, I wear it all day. And when I feel like using it, I don't want the battery to run out. So I want to be able to turn it on and off. And so we're testing out muscle switches that are movable to, so that you can move it to any muscle that might be able to generate a potential that turns it on and off. Um, you know, people have thought about eye blinks, but if somebody can't really blink that effectively, or you'd be, you know, if you're just sitting there, um, you know, you could uh, turn your, you know, you could blink all the time. You'd be blinking and you'd be blinking, turning things on and off. That was one of the students suggested that. And I said, no, because every time you blink, you'd turn your machine on, off, on, off, you know. So, so we have to figure out a different way, but, but we're working on that. That needs a solution too. And, but we'll, we'll get there. That I, I think we'll, we'll use the muscle switch. We're practice, we're actually studying mu the muscle switches now and, and tracking them over time to see if those potentials go away. And anyway. That's, uh, ama that's amazing. One of the things I know that is a huge discussion topic for us is um, uh, biomarkers. And we had a question I want to uh, ask right now, uh, since you saw changes in F, uh, NIR with ALS, could it have potential as a biomarker of disease progression? And could you put it over the motor strip instead of the frontal pole? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah the answer is yes, yes, yes. So we, we know, <clears throat> I know that FNIR does change. First of all, it, it, the reason we started to look at it, and I didn't show that that data, because it wasn't so relevant, um, was that in people with frontotemporal dementia, it's frontal, uh, they, you can clearly detect changes that are far and above classic um, ALS. And my, when I originally started using it, it was really to be an easily deployable way to detect changes that would indicate somebody was going to develop cognitive involvement early in the disease. And so that you could track that. And over time, we could see that it got worse. Um, and, and so, and in terms of putting it over the motor strip, uh, you, you can try to get the electrodes there and, we'll, and that's actually been looked at. And the, the short answer is yes. So it could be used as a, a disease tracking uh, in, you know, for, for the motor system. But, but the frontal lobe is also involved anyway. Uh, so, and even in somebody who's cognitively intact, that's what I was showing, there's involvement of the frontal lobe. Thank you, that's awesome. Um, another question asked was, can users access the internet with this system? Yes. Okay, great. Thank yeah, that would, be, that would be one of the, you know, those functions that I showed you, you would, you would choose uh, like email or, or um, Google, Chrome, whatever, yeah, whatever you used, and then you could spell what you wanted in the, that could all be, that would be programmed. That would be one of those plug and plays that I talked about that, that we would, we would be wanting to develop software for all of those. And, and, you know, um, we are working on that. I saw somebody was asking about gaming and gaming software and 3D printing. And yeah, we're doing all that. And actually, uh, I'm I'm pretty lucky because my son uh, is a gamer, and he writes gaming for pro programs for for games, and he's going to be uh, helping uh, helping us with some of that. Um, speaking of just the physical use of the software, it, with yours since it's it's placed on the head, do you That's have to have hardware, actually? Yeah. So the software is what the programming that you use to drive things. You know to 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 decide what what action you want to take. The hardware is that cap. The cap. Yeah. 
So does the hardware, in order to use the hardware, thank you for, for uh, clarifying that. Yeah, so yeah, I'm learning too, okay? <laughs> because I have to get the right engineers involved. <laughs> because that's biomedical engineering. Improving signal acquisition is actually electrical engineering. So, so actually to work on this project, you need like five different types of engineers, software, computer, biomedical, electrical. But anyway, you were going to ask about the cat. Yeah, it's a lot. So I'm, I'm hopefully you'll have this in your wheelhouse. Um, for the cap portion, do you have to have short or shaved hair or can you have long hair and also have it work as well? It doesn't, it's better if you don't have a lot of hair. Okay. Um, when you, if you have a lot of hair, sometimes we have to wet the electrodes, which isn't, it's water wet, not glue wet. It's not like the gel wet that we, we have with the, with the old, with the research style cap, that 32 electrode cap and the 16 electrode cap there's actually gel you use that it's like glued to your head uh but you use a water but yeah i mean it does work better with a, a shaved head um, isn't that in style now i mean yeah it, it goes <laughs> right with the fashion <laughs> I was just about to joke um, about we'll have to leave our our seventies long hair um, at the door, <laughs> but I you know full of not as funny jokes. I'm I'm curious. One of the questions is uh, you mentioned about having to program for different functions. Do you have to then work with the other software companies in order to integrate, say, uh, different browsers for the internet or different apps like for Alexa or Google Home? Yeah, well, we actually have worked with the Alexa. We, we are able to program, for, you know, internally, you know, it depends like the language that you use that will talk to the Alexa or the, you know, the um, Google Home Assistant. Uh, and usually there you can get the AI, the uh, interfaces that you need by talking to the companies. But yeah, that's part of the programming issues is so that all of these pieces of equipment talk to each other, right? So you have to get the cap talking to, to the computer, talking to the Alexa. And so that, that's where, and the other programming is, I, you know, the user interface. Like, how do I want my icons to look? We were doing very rudimentary things. You saw the last example that I showed you with the glasses and the LCD screen. It was just words. But you want to make it fancy? That's going to take programming. You want to make a picture. You want to put an icon in there. And we, that, we would want it to be, and we also want it to be easy so that people can select their what functions they want easily and user-friendly. And that's all user interface and user experience stuff. And that's programmed. So it's all software. That's the software part. Great. Um, our other question is, what sample size has been used to test this prototype and how did you ensure the validity of the results? Oh, yeah. Uh, the Well, you saw, you know, the one was uh, about 19 patients. You know, we're only up to five on our, you know, and what we're doing now, it's called I'm just beta testing and seeing if if I can get it to work right. Then we would look at. Then you'd want you'd want a number of people. It depends on what this. You'd have to power. You have to do a power analysis based on the standard deviation when you look at uh, efficiency. So you'd want to know how efficient is it? How many choices were correct? You know, if I wanted, I gave you 20 trials, and I told you to so make a selection. How many times did you get it right? That would be the efficiency. And what's the standard deviation? Then you do a power calculator. But I would imagine, I would imagine 10 to 20 folks um, to start just to look and you know for usability of the system and, and for efficiency. And then you're gonna have to take it to different levels, right? Different levels of severity. Um, and that, that's what we were doing that in that first experiment I showed you was looking over the course of the illness. Um, and we've even have some data looking at the same person with the, with the really research, heavy research tool that we used for um, the, that first set of experiments I showed you. Um, the big system, the $25,000 system, we, 
we've tracked some people over time. Again, because I'm concerned that the potential will change over time and I want something that's gonna be usable over, over the course of the illness, no matter how long. So, so you know, we're collecting that type of data as well. It's amazing. And I know your time is very valuable. So we're gonna make this our very last question before we open up to our open forum. Uh, lastly, how can individuals sign up for updates on your program and perhaps refer patients or themselves for participation if they would like to implement this into their own homes? Or just contact me. And we usually get, uh, you know, we, we put a, a lot up, um, you know, we, we have a, a newsletter out of the ALS Hope Foundation. This work is primarily funded by the ALS Hope Foundation. And, you know, and, you know, any way I can put together a shoestring budget, which is why we're not there yet. But, um, but we often will give an update uh, on our website, on the ALS Hope Foundation website or just email me, call me, um, be glad to, to have you. Everybody's welcome. We're, we love to have participants. We, have, we also do weekly calls and I have some pals who join our calls every week uh, and, and because we want input. I, I, you know, it does me no good to do all this fancy stuff if it's not useful to people. And if it's not gonna do what folks want it to do so so we do like you know we do like to have involvement at all levels perfect i want to thank you we're going to open this up to our open forum now it's it's not recorded you're welcome to stay but we understand your time is very valuable i'm going to turn this back over to mcfinn and i will stop the recording as well <laughs>